this replaces some of what we might have been able to offer you in the choral open day. And uh, with us here this afternoon are various directors of music representing choirs uh, from across the university at different uh, levels of commitment. Uh, and also a number of choral scholars also representing choirs at different levels of commitment and different subject areas. Um, the format of this afternoon is very straightforward in that each director of music will say something briefly uh, about the sort of choir that they represent, um, trying uh, in theory as hard as possible not to not directly to plug their own choir, um, but at the same time you, you will know um, about whom they are speaking. Um, so they'll speak about their own experience and about generally what you might expect from a choir that has the sort of timetable that they do. Um, and so each of the five directors will talk about their choirs in, in those terms. Um, after that, there's a series of questions and answers. So if you have a question for us, please tweet to us um, or send us a message in the chat um, and we'll come to it as soon as we possibly can. Um, I'm just going to start with um, the person nearest to me on my screen, which is Andrew. Would you begin telling us a little bit about your choir, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Andrew Nethsinger and I'm Director of Music at St John's. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. And I suppose um, in talking about St John's, I'm the, the kind of category of commitment, I suppose what I'm saying applies mostly to St John's and King's um, in the R2 levels of commitment are quite similar. So at St John's we have two choirs in Chapel, a fabulous mixed voice choir uh, which sings one service a week and the college choir which I run which has boy trebles on the top line um, and like Kings we have seven services every week, uh, even song at 6.30 each day except Monday and also a Eucharist on Sunday mornings. We just have one hour's rehearsal prior to each service so the time commitment is not as great as you might think. Uh, and people tend to find that the choir provides a helpful, helpful framework to the day uh, with plenty of time for academic work before choir and plenty of time for extracurricular things after choir. We do a very broad repertoire, uh, mainly from sort of 1500 or so up to the present day and include, including termly Bach cantata even songs with leading period instrument players. Uh, the choir here has made over a hundred recordings, which you can hear online. Uh, our most recent one's called Magnificat 2. Uh, there are frequent broadcasts on radio and TV in this country and abroad, plus lots of concerts in prestigious venues, uh, most recently in Europe, USA and the Far East. Um, however, we're never out of the country for more than a couple of weeks each year, perhaps three at most, because I think it's extremely important um, that our singers have loads of time for non-musical interests. And I'm also increasingly mindful of avoiding excessive air travel from a climate change perspective. Um, in choirs like ours, everything is paid for on our tours and the student singers receive at least 1500 a year in fees. Uh, and here we have four altos, five tenors and seven basses in the choir. And they get together as a group outside chapel to do lots of fun close harmony singing, calling themselves the gents, and they get additional income from that. The choir does lots of socialising together, whether in hall or in the pub or elsewhere. And for me, nurturing a warm and mutually supportive atmosphere is an extremely important aspect of the choir. I think it's a great way of life being in a choir like St John's. Uh, we have fantastic singing teachers uh, at St John's and King's uh, led by David Lowe in both both places and many choir members from this kind of choir go on to be professional musicians uh, though lots do other professions whether you know lawyers, teachers, doctors all, all sorts of things. So I'm always extremely pleased to meet um, singers, prospective applicants on Zoom. So please do get in touch with me and it'd be lovely to have a one to one chat. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next closest to me on the screen is Ralph Allwood. I run a choir which is a moderate time commitment and um, we have plenty of people doing all subjects. As it happens, we have more doing natural sciences than anything else. 
and um, quite often those who just are a little bit worried about natural sciences or medicine at large commitment places might choose us but don't take that as you can't go to the larger places and do medicine because you just need to check it on an individual basis. We sing even song on a Wednesday, even and uh, we have a practice on a Friday followed by Compline, and then we do even song on a Sunday. We do away events, um, and I'm trying to say we, meaning colleges like ours, do away events um, as well. We're just planning a tour in England this summer of cathedrals, which should be enormous fun. We all get on with each other extremely well, and I'm sure everybody will, will say that. Um, there's something magical about a team of people that sing. And um, I think we would all, sitting here, um, put our head up high and say that somehow the singing makes the socializing better and certainly the socializing when you know each other in a team it makes the singing better and um, we all find that ours is a lovely college but then every I'm not trying to say ours is a lovelier college than anyone else's it's um there's lots and lots of beautiful beautiful colleges we do have people from outside it's worth saying we have people from meaning not from our college singing and uh, we welcome them and some people think it's nice to get away from the social group of their college for a change and come come to ours we make absolutely certain no one's left out of anything we do expect people to know the notes when they arrive and largely that's when they arrive at a service at a rehearsal for a service and um, largely people do stick to that or let me know if they can't and again that's universal I think everybody everybody expects that there's a lot of other music going on at our college there's the mad sock for us um, and um, where people can play their instruments again there are instrumental opportunities absolutely everywhere in abundance so um and we all we have a wonderful organ which is slightly sharp so in our case so those with perfect pitch start off being annoyed but then they they get it straight away they've got two different perfect pitches anyway do ask further questions in the chat uh ralph thank you very much um i wonder if actually continuing the, the, on, the on the subject of lots of extracurricular music um Graham. Yes. Let's go Hello there, everyone. So I direct uh, the choir at Clare College, and um, Clare College Choir fits in, uh, into the category um, of, of about five or six or so choirs in Cambridge that follow roughly the same level of commitment. That's to say, most of us doing three services a week with rehearsals um, directly before it and occasionally with an extra rehearsal as well. So for my choir at Clare, we rehearse and sing services on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Sundays. And at Clare, we also have an additional one hour rehearsal on a Wednesday. And other colleges such as Trinity and Selwyn and Gonville Keys and Jesus College, um, Sydney Sussex and a few others, I think, as well, have a similar level of commitment. And um, I, I would say the advantage of joining a choir like that is it gives you a few days in the week when you're not singing and when you're not involved with um, choir and preparation for your services. So typically I found over the years that lots of my students and members of my choir um, have a rich and enriching time as part of their commitment to the choir, but they also have lives outside uh, and dare I say it, even time to complete their academic studies. Uh, so in addition to our three services a week, we tend to sing the service of Choral Evensong, Anglican Choral Evensong, and I think it's important to stress uh, this is the case, I think, for all of our choirs, is that we have um, no uh, requisite um, necessity to follow a particular faith. If you're a member of our choirs, uh, you can be belonging to a faith or you could have no faith at all or you could belong to a different faith um, from the Christian faith and all that we ask is that you respect the tradition that we sing and that we provide the music for the liturgy in our chapels um, for the members of the congregation who attend and increasingly so I think in the last few years uh, many of us have now engaged with live streaming and so our services are available all across the world um, for people to tune in and I know certainly during the pandemic that's been a great balm for many people. 
Um, the students, when uh, they're not involved in choir, are typically, um, lots of them are music students and reading music, but very many students are reading other academic subjects. And for me, one of the things I enjoy most as director of music is the rapport and the interactions amongst those students, particularly when we're in rehearsals together, but also when we're, we're on tour or doing concerts or recording or, or broadcasts. And the friendship group that you make amongst the people who are in the choir is really rich and varied. And I, I can say that as both an alumnus and a director of music. You, you find that you've got people who have a shared love and interest of singing and of making music, but also they have many other interests in their life. And so you can have interesting conversations that range everything from caterpillars to astrophysics and lots in between. Uh, Pete just mentioned briefly about extracurricular activities. Um, at Clare College, where, where I run the music, we have a very rich musical life in the chapel, but also a very rich musical life in terms of the College Music Society, which is student-run, and they put on their own concerts, symphonic concerts. We hire out um, West Road, the main concert hall in Cambridge, for a couple of concerts each year. A very active music club, which does not just classical music, but jazz and um, contemporary music. And we have some wonderful spaces in our colleges, as I know lots of my colleagues do in their own colleges. I think really there's a chance I know for people to ask questions, but I think the last thing I, I really want to say on this opening gambit is actually what a wonderful experience it is to be a member of a choir. And I think that the experiences that you gain in being directed by often a professional and by spending time amongst other people who love what you love to do and to do it to as high a level as you possibly can get in addition to your academic studies is something really very special and very unique. And for me, when I go into Clare College Chapel at 6.15 on a Tuesday evening, I'm very aware that 30 of my colleagues are doing exactly the same thing with each of the members of their, their choirs. And Cambridge is really rich and buzzing with musical life uh, for our services. And whatever college you choose and whatever choir you choose to apply to, you will have a fantastic time in Cambridge and it can offer a great deal for you. So we look forward to welcoming you as soon as we can. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, Kat, who has the best collection of books and is also on mute. Kat will be giving her contribution via the medium of interpretive dance then. No, <laughs> no. I am actually somewhat more successful than my internet connection here at Fitzwilliam College. I'm not certain. Is that any better? I don't appear to be on mute from here. Can I have a thumbs up from anybody on the panel? Marvellous, good news. Well, thank you very much. I'm Director of Music at Fitzwilliam College. Um, and our choir would fit into the choral landscape as being a relatively low commitment. We sing a choral evening song on a Sunday evening. And in addition to the pre rehearsal to the pre-service rehearsal on a Sunday, also rehearse on a Thursday. There are extra services, uh, Advent, Ascension, uh, Lent, Easter and so on, um, as well as concerts in college during the term, which attract a few extra rehearsals. But the core commitment is relatively low. Um, that makes it, and, and, and choirs like, like mine, a gentle and friendly home for uh, a great mixture of people. We have specialist musicians who, whose, whose primary uh, out, output or aspiration may not be, be choral singing. We have pianists, violinists, oboists and so on. And we have singers singing, a, a reading a, a, a wide range of, of other subjects. Um, that, uh, that relatively low commitment and, and gentle friendly atmosphere of 18 to 24 undergraduates and graduates mostly fits um, is enough to enable I think a meaningful uh, vocal liturgical uh, emotional connection um, between people. It's a, it's a very, very happy group and we see lots of each other socially, but also enables a, a, a wide, wide range of extracurricular activities too. And in FITS, certainly one of the, uh, f the functions of that is a, a wide and diverse uh, range of choral activities. We have a, a present four choirs in college in, in the autumn, that's about to be five. We're, in addition to the, to the robed liturgical chapel choir, we have a mixed 
a cappella group, a male a cappella group, and a female a cappella group. And from October, we will also have a gospel choir, which will sing services on a Sunday morning in equal status to the, the chapel choir. And it will be possible to hold a choral scholarship in either of those types of liturgical choir and in that way we hope that we off what we offer is um a, a, perhaps a, a coherent and, and a knitted together way of balancing sacred and secular singing which i'm certainly here at fits we feel is very much in keeping with the the ethos of, of college um singing lessons uh happen tours uh, with the, the chapel choir, we attempt to tour every year or so, alternating abroad and not abroad. Again, like Andrew, not, not flying as little as possible. Um, I've mentioned singing lessons. We have a CD recording coming up. So it's, it's, it's nonetheless meaningful choral, choral singing, which allows a lot of space in life for, for other things. And again, I'd be really happy to hear questions from you. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Um, and lastly, I believe, I'm not missing any directions of music here, I think, Ben. Thank you, Peter. Um, and in fact, I'm an assistant director of music um, at King's College, Cambridge. And rather like Andrew was saying earlier, we adopt uh, two choirs. Um, there's the, the boys and men's choir, um, which is known as the chapel choir. But we also have uh, another choir, which I direct, uh, which is called King's Voices, which was primarily set up just over 20 years ago to cater for uh, women being able to uh, experience uh, the musical life of the chapel. Um, and like other colleagues this afternoon, um, one of these choirs, King's College Chapel Choir, um, has quite a, a large commitment. They sing seven services a week. Um, and again, like Andrew was saying, um, touring, recording, uh, broadcasting, um, so it is quite a big commitment, but with King's Voices, we also have a, a, a separate back row, as we call them, of, of tenors, altos, tenors and basses. Um, and this is just one service a week, so we sing Evensong on a Wednesday, rehearsing on a Monday. Um, the musical life of King's College is, is very rich, um, as like every other college in Cambridge. Um, one thing I would be prepared to say about um, the chapel choir with the boys and the men, which is altos, tenors and basses, is that they have a, a large commitment over Christmas, um, obviously uh, um, broadcasting the, the Christmas Eve service, but also recording some TV programmes for Christmas and Easter. So it is a much larger commitment. Um, and again, like uh, Kat was saying, um, amazingly friendly atmosphere in both choirs, um, I suppose, um, I'm much more experienced to the, the with the mixed choir. It's it's only one service a week, but we we also do a little tour, um, uh, circumstances permitting, um, in the uh, in the Easter vacation, and we also uh, get the opportunity to sing outside Cambridge as well, um, in cathedrals and and other chapels. Um, like my other colleagues have said this afternoon, that the whole thing of singing in a choir. Um, has so many benefits to it, not least the the musical and the social, but also the spiritual as well. And uh, Graham was saying earlier about, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a Christian um, to sing in a in a chapel choir. Um, it's a very safe space singing choral evensong in a chapel, whether it be actually evensong or even Compline, which is a service that happens right at the end of the day. Um, we've noticed an increasing number of students over the years who feel that going to a service in a chapel gives them extra space just to think and to reflect perhaps on the day, perhaps on their work, perhaps on what the future will hold. Um, and we, all of us on this call, have experienced that a great deal over the years. Um, I myself sang in a, in, a, as a student in, in King's College Chapel, actually, um, and I found it one of those transformative experiences that have lasted with me my whole life. Um, and I probably wouldn't be here today doing what I'm doing in Cambridge were it not for that. So it, it, it's a very important part of our life. And we know if you um, are interested, it'll be a very important part of your life as well. So happy to ask, answer any questions about Kings as, as we go on this afternoon. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much. Um, we have various questions that people have posed to us 
um, on Twitter and some via other means. Um, I think perhaps the best place to start is with how do you prepare for an audition? Um, and I think this, this might be an interesting one, both from the point of view of a director of music and also from a choral scholar. Um, actually, I, I'm going to be cruel and pick on Sarah, whose first audition here I heard, um, and ask, how did you prepare for it? Um, well, there's various parts to the choral audition. Um, so the bit that I was preparing most for was singing a piece of music. Um, and I ended up doing something that I was preparing for my grade eight, um, but I know from when I came on a choral experience day, um, there was a girl there who said that I think she sang I Feel Pretty or something. Um, and as long as you're giving it your best shot and they can get an assessment of your voice, um, any song is good. Um, it was better than none. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was how I prepared for that. Um, with I, I have seen, had singing lessons at school and so I just performed that. Um, the harder bit for me was the sight singing and the oral tests because I I dropped music in year nine um, because I wanted to do drama instead. <laughs> um, and so I haven't really got such a um, musically trained background as such. I did my grade five theory, but I, I'd not dedicated hours of my life to it. It's like many people have. Um, but yes, sight singing is something that you give it your best shot and the choir that takes you will be the choir that's right for you. Um, if you do struggle more with sight singing, then maybe King's isn't the high commitment thing that you should be doing. But um, Kat was incredibly reassuring when I did mine uh, and so was Pisa. And we're just like, you're giving it a great shot and you're doing far better than you think you're doing. Um, even though my pitches were a bit off, my rhythm was pretty good. And so you can see that when someone does their audition. Basically, don't worry, like prep, get your song good, but don't overthink it and don't try and... I came out of one of my auditions and cried because I thought I'd done that badly, but I hadn't. I really, really hadn't. And it was all fine um, because they're really understanding before. And they know how nervous you are, is the other thing. Um, I wonder, Ralph, might I come to you on the subject of sightseeing? I know this is some, it's a subject dear to your heart. Thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for asking. I do think that people, if they've been a chorister, they've been taught really well being from a young age and they're very fortunate. But why shouldn't more people than those who have been lucky enough to be choristers in cathedrals and college chapels be able to sight read? And they can. And I've <laughs> done a video, this is a commercial, I've done a series of videos on sight reading. I've written a book about uh, sight singing and I've done a series of um, videos that int introduce it. And you can do it if you just gently, carefully prepare it. Don't give yourself a sight reading uh, test every single time because that'll just make you panic. Take your time to work out the notes slowly with just you around and perhaps a nice friend helping you, perhaps a friend who wants to do it as well. And gradually, if you get it right, you will learn how to do it. But shall I put my videos in the chat? Will that reach people? I'm not sure that it will. They're um, free. They're, they're, the whole course is free for people in full-time education. So if know. you send it to me, Ralph, I can tweet it. Okie dokie, I'll do um, that right away. Or I'll tweet it as well. Graham, um, as, as someone who was a, a choral scholar as an undergrad and now directs a choir, um, do you have any insight into how you, as an undergrad, prepared for services and how you tell your singers now to do that? Yeah, I mean, I like to think that having been there and done it, uh, I, I have a relatively good sense of what they're going through, by, by which I mean, not just preparing for even song, but being aware that you know university life, particularly in Cambridge, is is rich and varied, but it can at times be quite full on. I don't think any of us would um, pretend that it's not. And I, I can't remember who was mentioning earlier about exam term and uh, you know how choirs can actually be a great solace for our students during what can often be quite. Um, a pressurised time to be able to come back to do something at a regular time of the day um, for a, a couple of hours really helps to take one's mind off whatever else is going on uh, during the day. But I think in terms of preparing for services, whether as a director or whether as a, a as a 
former member of a choir, I, I would say that the process is actually still the same. You know, you, you want to support your colleagues and making music is very much a collective thing. None of us are dictatorial. None of us want to ensure that something is done one way. It should be a collaborative process. And I think that certainly what I found at Clare is that my students want to support each other. So if you're the person who's been assigned to do a big solo, or perhaps not even a big solo, perhaps just two bars of a verse anthem, and you haven't prepared that, but everyone else has prepared it, then it's not so much about um, letting yourself down, it's more about letting other people down. And I think that that's um, something that's a really helpful environment in a way. You know, we help to support one another. We're aware of what we're going through um, each day and, and what our even songs can do. But in terms of preparing for the services, um, we, we do expect you to put some work in. And the, the idea is it's not to, to be draconian and um, rules-based, it's so that you get the most out of it. And certainly I think any student who's sung in any choir in any university will agree that three years goes extremely quickly. And, you know, from the day that you start to the day that you graduate can be a very quick time. And we want you to enjoy every minute of it. So the better prepared you are, the more you're going to get out of it. I think all that I would add, if I may, just about sight reading is, um, firstly, don't panic. That's definitely important to know. And I think there's this wonderful thing called osmosis, where you tend to learn off your neighbours. And I always say to people who are applying to me at Clare, if you can sight read, of course, that's great. We'll be delighted to see that. But really, it doesn't matter if it's not your forte. Because I think what you find is when you're standing next to someone, particularly who's been in the choir for a year or two years or even longer, and inevitably there's some repetition of, of repertoire and the like, you do pick things up. And, and I think that you'll be surprised how quickly you can learn. So yes, I would always want you to put the work in. Yes, I would want you to try and have as good oral skills and sight reading skills as you can, but you really do learn on the job as well. So I think that's an important point um, to make. Julia in my choir is nodding at me as if that's something that she's in agreement with. That's encouraging. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think it is, it's worth reiterating as many times as we possibly can during this, that our different levels of commitment involve different levels of uh, preparation. I had a really embarrassing incident trying to sight read as an undergraduate, um, and I could read the piece perfectly well, but someone had put some really interesting graffiti in the middle of it, um, which unfortunately made me crack up in the middle of the service. Um, and I've never since not opened my music before a service. Um, Kat, I think, would like to talk from the perspective of a choir that sings only one service a week and so you have a little bit more time um, on the subject of, of, of sight reading. Yes, I, I, I did want to comment that I've, I've had a few comments over the, the years from my choral scholars about the terror they had felt um, at applying to join a lower commitment choir and being presented with ostensibly the same sight reading um, as is seen by an applicant to a higher commitment choir and I wondered whether I might just say something a little bit reassuring on that note um, that whereas a director of music of a, a higher a higher commitment choir will be selecting singers who are capable of handling the music list written for them. A director of music of a lower commitment choir will be writing her or his music list um, uh, to, to fit the raw material that, that, that she or he, or he has, has got. So I will look at my, my core of scholars, my singers, um, and work out their strengths, weaknesses, what's, what's good for them, and I will be tailoring my music list appropriately. And so for me and for many others, I suspect in my position, um, the sight reading test at audition is largely diagnostic. I'd like to know where you're confident, where you're not confident. Um, it is not a bar that you have to meet. And I wonder if that's something that's a little reassuring to bear in mind. Um, one of the things that we, we do at FITS that I perhaps ought to have mentioned earlier and, 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 and typically didn't, is that we do an annual fully staged opera and the, the choir provides some of the principles but also the chorus and we teach the chorus by ear. So there is that choral opportunity for there for, for those who don't read at all. Of course, the more that you read, the more that you can do and the more comfortable you you are just 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 as with 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 reading in in english um but i think it's worth worth bearing in mind that in the context in which you're singing the the sight reading may be diagnostic rather than a bar that may be reassuring 
Kat, thank you very much. Um, Andrew, may I come to you both on this and on the, and at the start of the next question? Um, the, the, the next question is actually simply, simply. what's your favourite piece of music that you've done in chapel? Um, which I suspect is something of a personality test. But um, Andrew, if you if you want to come in on the on the sight reading issue and then and then address the next thing also, that'd be wonderful. Uh, sure. Um, I just wanted to add regarding sight reading. Um, I, I think I mean one one thing is that it's very good for everybody to try to practice it a bit from as early on um, as you can, uh, because you know it, it, it's. It's really beneficial for you if you can if you can get better at, at, at intervals and, and reading and so forth. Having said all that, um, don't I mean, I might go sort of very slightly contrary to what Kat said just now as regards my kind of choir. Um, it would be easy to think you can only join a choir like um, St. John's. I can't, I can't speak for Kings, but it might be similar that you can only join this kind of choir if you're totally fantastic at sight reading. and. Uh, that's absolutely not the case in St John's. I mean, we, you know, we tend to have um, some people uh, who are brilliant singers and really not at all good at sight reading, and some who are um, extremely good at sight reading and perhaps haven't got quite such advanced voices and and you know and and sort of all varieties. So, um, I, I believe that you can't make a choir without voices and so um you know I, I i i want to choose people on their vocal merit rather than just on sight reading ability um now what was the what was the other thing pete that you wanted me to um this this was about the oh, uh, pieces oh yes 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 well, um okay um uh well my favorite piece is the one that we're singing in even song tonight um yeah uh which might be uh birds ne irascaris or might be um, Jonathan Harvey Magnificat, or it might be a Bach Cantata, or all sorts of other things. Um, uh, and I think most students arrive in Cambridge with a with an area of the repertoire which they particularly like, um, and many other areas that they are less familiar with. And I suppose my aim is to make it so that by the time people leave this kind of choir, they'll actually have a a great love for for a much wider breadth of repertoire. Thank you. Um, Julia, may I pose the same question to you? Yeah, of course. I think exactly what Andrew was saying about kind of arriving and thinking you like a certain type of music and then kind of learning on the job and finding all sorts of new pieces that you really enjoy. I think that's really true. Um, particularly for us, I can remember in Michaelmas term, we did a Swedish, I think, piece um, that was completely bonkers and nothing like I'd ever done before, um, but was so enjoyable. And I think my experience in choir is never judge a piece until you've had to go over the same bar about 50 times uh, <laughs> because you might end up loving it. <laughs> so, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, can I just share with everyone my excitement about a piece of music I've just discovered? by Peter Abelard called Epithalamica, um, which if you ever come across this, I'm, I'm totally in love with this piece right now. Um, anyway, just, just, just wants to share my excitement with you about this one thing. Um, Alistair, could you share your excitement with us about your favourite piece, please? My favourite piece? I'm not sure. I, I, I'd say that one of my favourite things about um, since, since starting singing at John's is like the exposure to lots of new stuff, like kind of like what Julie was saying. Um, so like at, at John's, we have this like we often go like andrew will commission pieces like one or two a term maybe i'm not sure um often by like students in cambridge at the time and so you can kind of get exposed to all sorts of different stuff and some of it is like really really amazing so i'm particularly like thankful for lots of that uh yeah exposure and um favorite piece i think maybe i mean we did the finzi low the fall recently which was really fun and i mean it's a bit of a whopper and when when the whole choir is singing kind of full throttle it does feel pretty good um so i can't complain with that but that that kind of genre of just like you know meaty stuff i can get on board with that <laughs> it's such a great piece yeah. um 
I, I have an indelible memory of Liverpool Final Sacrifice, someone trying to pull out the clarinet stop and hitting the tuba instead during that really emotive duet, um, Self Wounding Pelican, which is dreadful. Um, ben. Thank you. Yes, I think I think this is a a, a crossroads time for us in in the choral community, um, not just in in Cambridge or Oxford or any other university or in chapel music, but it's a it's a seismic moment really because we've we've begun to wake up and realise um, how important better representation is across our repertoire, and it's great to see in Cambridge that we are we are grabbing hold of this. Um, and as soon as you say something like, you know, what's your favourite piece? Of course, you know, Alistair was saying, well, it's just the, 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 the sheer range of things that we do. But with that comes an amazing exploration of pieces that we may not necessarily have thought about in the past and things that basically had had not been given the light of day. Two things I'd mention. One is a piece by actually it's an alum of, of Cambridge, Janet Wheeler, who has written a wonderful piece called Alleluia, I Heard a Voice, which is a you know famous text uh, uh, set by Renaissance composers, but she's done her own version. And it's an extraordinary kind of whirlwind of sound, which in any building would sound amazing. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, an, a, a, an enchanting piece that uh, a Ghanaian priest sent me from Africa called Master Speak, um, Sadi Beku, he's called. And he sent me this hymn um, that he'd written and we did it as an introit in King's College Chapel and we recorded it and I sent it back to him and he could not believe that his music was being sung in Cambridge. Um, these are all really important pivotal moments for us in the choral industry and I think you know as we've all been saying this afternoon that exploration and the discovery of these amazing pieces I mean I love the, the way that we call it Low the Full I mean lots of people who know that piece will know it as Low the Full that doesn't mean anything to a lot of you guys but you know these are these are these are great moments when we discover these amazing pieces that we can sing and the list is growing bigger and because we are now being more explorative and more understanding and more empathetic about better rep representation in the singing industry, I'm I'm really excited um, about what next year can offer, even for, for for King's Voices. You know, I've got some new pieces out there because I've I've discovered them over the past year through sheer adversity. Um, so I think you know any any piece that we throw at you, you will you will love and you will cherish it and you will take it take it away with you. You know, we have our old thumping war horses of the Anglican repertoire. You know who can forget Stanford and Parry and all these people, but there's some amazing stuff out there, and I think what you'll find is we celebrate that um, in the Cambridge choirs. And thank you. And um, unless anyone has anything pressing to add, I should like to move on to the next question, which is about a day in the life of a choral scholar, um, and or perhaps a week in the life might be more representative. And I wonder, Harry, if you might come to us on that. Um, yes. So. I sing at um, Gonville and Keys College, which is, has a similar commitment level to at Clare. Um, so we have three services a week, which are Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday, um, and um, one hour rehearsals before each of those. Um, and then we also have two more um, one hour long rehearsals uh, on Monday and Wednesday. So we are singing five of the seven days um, in the week, which might sound like quite a lot, but um, it's just in the evening and I don't feel like it's it's too much commitment. I feel like it's um there's a lot there's a lot of time to do other things as well. So and it also offers a lot of social opportunities, maybe not this year because of COVID, but um it's always nice to find the um find your friends in the choir and uh it's and spend time with them outside choir as well. So yeah. It's a mixture of musical and social, um, I'd say. That's how the week goes. Thank you. Ben, I wonder if you might come in on this as well, particularly about work-life balance. And actually, what would be really helpful is if you might be able to give us some indication of how it feels in terms of your work-life balance here. Well, I mean, I say work-life, work where life also includes choir, um, as opposed to being at school. Assuming we Ben, not Ben Parry. Um, uh, yeah, no, 
Yeah, I would kind of just really echo what Harry said. So I sing at Jesus, which is also five days a week. Um, and it's it does just kind of, it feels like a very nice end of the day thing. Because it's kind of five o'clock every day. I just, most days I just go to chapel and sing. Um, and it's just kind of a really nice kind of relaxing activity. And then I often don't usually work after that. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of school, I mean, kind of compared to A-levels, um, being at Cambridge can be quite uh, intense in terms of work. Um, but I think it is very manageable and it's obviously so much independent kind of working out your own time. Um, and choir is a really lovely kind of um, structuring part of that that kind of regulates my day. Um, and then I have the evenings after that to relax and do things with my friends, go to the bar with people from choir or with other people. Um, so yeah, I actually find it really helps with my work-life balance. Um, and as people were saying earlier, especially in the exam term, when kind of there's fewer contact hours and everything, it's really lovely to have some kind of consistent structure all the time. Thank you, Ben. Um, do any of the directors of music want to come in on this in terms of observation? Andrew? Um, thanks. Um, well, I wanted to agree particularly with what Ben Gibson said just now um, about um, the, the way that one of the higher commitment choirs can actually help to provide a structure to the day. I, I think many people find that um, leaving school and coming to university, um, you know, at, at school, even, even in sixth form, you, you, you have quite a a, a well managed timetable okay with with a number of free periods and things but there are there are lots of clearly defined things in each day and you might arrive in cambridge i mean it depends a bit what subjects you're doing but i mean you might arrive and and there are huge watches of time that actually you haven't got anything at all in your diary um and uh certainly the people in 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 our court st john's um often comment to me on how they find the, the sort of regular thing of being in chapel from 5.15 to 7.15 each day, um, a, a very helpful um, uh, kind of stru structure to um, pivot to their day. And I remember bumping into somebody who sang in our choir for three years, but then stayed on and did a fourth year in college without singing in the choir. And I said to him, in this fourth year, you know, you you must have so much free time now. You must, you know, you must be doing far far more work than you were before. He said, "No, I'm not doing any more work than I was before." Um, it, it, you know, he. Uh, so I think it's a it's a it's a popular misconception that a choir like St John's or perhaps Kings, um, you 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 can't do anything socially as well. You can't do well academically, and and actually, you know, loads of the people in our choir get firsts. Um, loads of the people in our choir do extracurricular things whether it's you know playing playing football or rugby or or acting or in operas or jazz or whatever um um so yeah don't it, it's it's not as big a time commitment as as you may think and and actually it's totally compatible with things like natural sciences as well because laboratories finish before even song rehearsal starts thank you um i wonder Yes, because there's there's so much to talk about on this on this very subject. Um, we should before moving on. I would love to hear from somebody who has who sings one service a week and uh, has other things to do. And I think that's that's Great Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have the rehearsal and service on Sunday nights, and then the rehearsal on Thursday nights. Um, and especially the Sunday night service, it's a brilliant way to finish the week because after we have the the service we all go to the bussery and have pizza and wine and not wine um which one is a bonding experience for the choir and a really good way to relax but especially on a sunday night even though cambridge weeks are thursday to thursday um sunday is still the end of the week in my mind um and so it's a good way to just chill out and not push myself too much um i also find that i often have deadlines on monday for whatever reason um which could make it very easy to stay up all of sunday night working to try and get it handed in but choir very much is a thing that you have to stick to and commit to um which makes the work more pressing and so you actually get it done um i'm very much the type of person who leaves things to the last minute um but having something like choir there means that the last minute is 4 30 on a sunday instead of midnight um which is not such a healthy working pattern for me anyway um so yeah the low commitment is 
much better and I've got time to do, well, it, it works for me. Um, and I have time to do lots of different extracurricular activities, um, including other music and also sport. Um, but it's still, like everyone said, the structure that it gives you is really helpful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think it's worth saying, I mean, from, from my point of view as, as someone who read music and, and sang uh, like Ben did at King's, um, the, the, the choir always gives back to you what you give to it. And whatever you're prepared to put in, you, you will receive back. And it can seem a bit thankless at times, but I think it's whatever the level you choose, um, you invariably find that it's, it's, it's really rewarding and often in ways you don't necessarily expect. Um, I, I wonder if we can continue on this, this, this level of this, this subject of uh, managing time within particular subjects. Um, I've had a tweet from someone who's in fact already got a place for this year um, to read medicine and is interested in how uh, people in, in, in various situations uh, deal with that. And I wonder, uh, Harry, if you might speak to that. Uh, yeah, sure. So at Keys, uh, we actually have two medics in the choir at the moment. Um, Laura, who's a first year, and Artemis, who is second year. And they both um, manage their, their academic work and the choir, the choir work um, really well. Uh, they're both excellent singers. And um, as far as I know, they're excelling in their subjects as well. So yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a balance that can be made. Ben. Hello, Ben Parry. Yeah, and just to come off the back of what Harry was saying there, I think these are all life skills, aren't they? Um, if you think about time management and commitment and teamwork and all those sorts of things, you're going to th th those skills you will then take through to your 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 further adult life. So I would like to think that what you learn by having to commit to a choir, much as you would, you know, if you were doing um, a theatre show or you were rowing or you were playing rugby or whatever. That sense of commitment, I think, is 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 really important, and 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 learning those skills. They're all transferable skills. Um, singing in a choir. I mean, colleagues have said earlier on this call, you know, what a what a transformational um, notion it is being in a choir. Uh, and I'm sure our our, our singers here, student singers, um, hopefully would would endorse that. I think I think that that notion, as I say, of 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 thinking about commitment and what that means to you, time management. Uh, we've we've all got mobile phones now. We all have diaries. We all read texts or emails or whatever. It's much much easier to be in touch. Dare I say, in the day than I was a student, uh, you had to cycle round the colleges and put little pieces of paper on people's doors, pin it to the door, and they may not see it or it may have fallen off and been blown away by the wind. We all have methods of communication now that are very easy to understand. Um, but we still need to exercise that idea of good admin and good management. And I think singing in a choir will back that up 100 percent. Thank you, Ben. Um, unless anyone has anything further to share on the, the subject of effective time management. There are loads of hours in the week, by the way. There are more hours in the week in Cambridge than there are anywhere else in the world, it seems. Um, I'd, I'd love to, for us to be able to talk a little. Sorry, Ralph, you are... Was that your hand? Yes. I just wanted to say that in all my teaching in schools and university, not a single student or, or pupil has ever come to me when they've left and said, if only I'd done less music, I would have got a better degree or better results. Perhaps they wouldn't, but I quite often push them and I've never had that result. Thank you. Um, the, the, the next question is, is a more general thing around um, what happens in and out of term um, in terms of, of, of general commitments and uh, within term and more specific touring and recording things out of term, what people are expected to do. And um, Graham, if you might come to this first, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think different different choirs do different things. And I think it's worth saying for anyone applying or thinking of applying, it, it is worth doing a little bit of homework because um, some choirs will, will, well, as we've been talking about already, obviously have a bigger commitment within the term itself. But I think it's also worth 
doing a little bit of homework about what happens outside of the academic terms. And for those who aren't aware, the Cambridge term is extremely short. It's just eight weeks. So there's three eight-week terms throughout the year, and it doesn't take a mathematician to work out. So that, that leaves a lot of weeks of the year which are not academic terms. And um, at Clare, uh, we uh, ask our students in the choir to be expecting to give up about six weeks of the vacation time spread out over the year to choir commitments and typically that falls as, as two weeks at Christmas time, two at Easter and two in the summer. And sometimes it's a bit more than that and sometimes it's a bit less and it's often not as rigid as that as a, as a two-week block. It's often maybe five days here and then a few days there. I think um, what's so good about being a choral scholar in a place like Cambridge is of course the music for choral Eden song and the liturgy and all of the repertoire that you get to um, assimilate during your time as a choral scholar but it's all the other stuff as well and I don't just mean all the social things we've been talking about it's the other musical experiences that you get and I think it's worth saying that a choir like mine and I know a number of others as well um, expose our students not just to religious music but we often sometimes sing secular music and typically for us at Clare we, we do lots of concerts with um, orchestras and with other choirs and with other ensembles so um, just before the pandemic, for example, we, we took the choir over to Mexico and we did some concerts over there with um, one of their symphony orchestras. And we were singing some sacred repertoire, but plenty of other stuff as well that, that doesn't fit into a religious mould. And some of those pieces are familiar and we've sung things like Beethoven 9 things in the past. And other things are really unexplored gems that Ben Parry was mentioning earlier, things that we've been trying to explore more of um, over the last few years. So I think in terms of the commitment outside of the term, it you can't really put a definite um, amount on it and it changes per year because of course we don't always do the same things every year but I think if you're going for a choir for example that perhaps records a CD every year or goes on tour or has a commitment to going on tour um, or does TV and radio work all of these kind of things that we do as enriching activities as choral scholars you can be expected to give up some of your vacation time and typically what we do at Clare is we try and attach that onto the end of a term or the beginning of a term so typically in your nice long summer vacation um, we wouldn't necessarily ask you to come on a tour slap bang in the middle of it if we could possibly avoid it so we'll try and do it at the end of the term and I think I remember from my times as a choral scholar they're really special and fun times because you see all of your non-choir students go home uh, and then you're left and, and you've got this beautiful grade one listed building with with just you and your other friends in the choir um, to go and wreak havoc no I don't mean that to, to go and prepare for your um, concerts and uh, it's a great time you get to stay on and I know for example at, uh, at King's and St John's you know often services carry on beyond the term as well. I think that's right, Andrew, isn't it? Certainly um, some, some extra services take place that perhaps fall outside of the academic term. So I, I would just say do a little bit of your homework. We've all got websites for our choirs. You can go and have a look and see what kind of things each choir gets up to. Um, and and just, to, just to finish on this point, um, we talked about medicine. Someone's thinking of applying reading medicine. Some colleges have specific restrictions on academic subjects. So some chapel choirs will actively um, not allow you to sing in the choir if you study a particular subject. And that's simply for time management issues. But um, all, all of that information, I think, Pete, is available online, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I wonder if actually linking into some of what Graham has said, um, on the subject of commitments outside of term and residence requirements. Um, if Alistair, uh, you might tell us a little bit about how this works for you. Um, and perhaps if you can touch on the financial aspects of that and how, how uh, we're supported in that sure. outside of term. So, I mean, because I'm a second year at the moment, so I've, I've been quite disrupted. My, term, my time at Cambridge has been quite disrupted by coronavirus. So I'm not the... And you might be able to answer this a bit better, but I would say that this, the stuff outside of term time, the tours, concerts, and stuff like that, or extra services, like that is that is the best bit because because you don't have you're not snowed under with work and stuff. You just like hang out with your friends, doing what you love, which is singing, and like it's it's like that, that that's why you're there. So if if that's like a reason, is if that's a cause for concern for applicants, I would say don't let it be because because that's it's just it's just the best bit. Um, what's the other aspect of the question? I can't remember. Um, it was about how um, 
how that works financially, because obviously you pay for a certain amount of accommodation, but then you might be expected to be in residence in excess of what yeah. that allows. So, so that's covered um, by, by by the colleges. Um, so yeah, so you, you're not expected to pay anything. I think I think that's true across the board, pretty much. Um, and then I know that at St John's, we uh, I didn't, didn't do it last year, but we'll hopefully do it this year. Uh, we have long back in the summer, where <clears throat> uh, it's about a month or something after after term finishes. It's um, just, just two 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 extra weeks of services. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and then maybe recording afterward after that and so, so like you're hanging around Cambridge a bit longer and uh, so you that that's all covered for you in terms of rent and stuff and you do get an extra stipend as well for that I think um, so it's just like like financially that's that's not a that's not a concern. Thank you so much, um, Andrew. If you have something further on this, can I come to you after Ben, um, who I'd like to ask on this subject also, Ben Parry. Yeah, just very briefly, I'm just going on what Alistair was saying, you know, those those moments out of term are are, are some of the best um, as as a singer in a choir. Um, and I'm sure Andrew will will talk a little bit to it. But we there's a similar model at, at King's. Um, so with with the, with the boys and men's choir, um, there is quite a big commitment out of out of term time. I mentioned earlier about Christmas, obviously, but also just thinking back to what Kat was saying about Fitzwilliam and, and, and Sarah. Um, because we sing relatively little within the term, i.e. only one rehearsal and one service a week, those those moments when we can spend time together and actually bond socially and musically are, are, are kind of almost even more important. I don't know whether you'd agree with that, Kat, that actually we, when we can go for a week um, on tour, um, and the last one we did, obviously, we couldn't go last year, but we had a week um, in Italy. And in fact, Graham, I think you'd done an Iceland tour shortly before or after we did. We had a week in Iceland a couple of years ago. It was the best time ever. I'd just been there the year before um, and the, the choir came back massively more motivated. So those are those are some of the some of the best moments, certainly. We tried to go to Iceland, but there was oh, a, a, you... there was a thing called coronavirus. Which I'm so in. sorry. But I maybe I could just maybe say um, J Julia, who who sings in Claire, is one of our sopranos. Julia, do you want to just mention Palm Desert Airport and their bonding experience and what that was? Oh my goodness! Yes. So um, one thing is touring is amazing. I mean, it is wonderful. You get to spend time with all your friends. But you also have um, the uh, moments that aren't quite so good, like when our plane kept being delayed and then cancelled and then delayed. And we spent about, I don't know, probably seven hours um, in an airport. Eleven hours. Eleven hours. See, I've just blocked it from my mind, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> no, um, we spent eleven hours in an airport all together. Um, but weirdly, I mean, it was quite fun. We were in the middle of like California or something and it was really sunny and just wonderful. Um, but yeah, a bit, a bit weird. Um, I would say though, as a languages student, one of my favorite things that we did was we went to Paris and we sang with the choir of the Notre Dame de Paris, which was incredible. And I got to practice my French, <laughs> which was also really fun. Um, but yeah, I think when you join a choir, you kind of don't realise how much extra stuff that you can have and how many amazing experiences you get that aren't in term time, but you do. Um, like from recording and going on tour and broadcasting. I mean, it's all wonderful. <laughs> Julia, thank you. Maybe, sorry, Andrew, do you have anything more on this subject? No, great. Um, Andrew, I'm, I'm sorry, Julia, I'm wondering about um, linguists and fourth years. And if you could say something, I mean, obviously, this is an experience that you've yet to have, but of how that works socially and um, how when, when you apply what your expectations are about singing in the choir for your first two years, then coming back afterwards and how it feels. Sorry, actually, I'm in fourth year now. Um, so I have I have experienced this. Um, I think probably in second year, I was a bit worried because I thought, oh gosh, I'm gonna go off to France and then all my friends are gonna have forgotten who I am and they'll have left and graduated and all of that. Um, but really this year I've just found you, you know what you're doing because you're in your fourth year of university and you're coming back to a choir that's super familiar. Um, 
and you meet loads of new people and really it's just great it's kind of like having first year again except without all the stress of not knowing anything um so it's it's really wonderful um and it must be said that I've been lucky because a couple of my friends in choir are also in fourth year doing languages um so we all came together and um, came back together for fourth year um but really don't worry uh the year abroad is amazing and when you come back from it you will find that you'll just fit straight back in and you'll probably have even more fun so don't worry Sarah um, just to speak on the same sort of note, I'm a first year classicist, but I'm doing the four year degree. Um, and so I've actually found the idea of being quite really reassuring when it comes to that, because you do have this kind of thing of, oh, what if all my friends leave after my third year and I'm just here on my own? Um, but one of the biggest benefits I've got from choir is getting to know people in other years. Like I've made friends with third year historians and second year musos and just um, all these people who and I'm sure in future years I will get to know the people in the lower years so when I am going into my fourth year it won't happen but even if all my friends did flee Cambridge and abandon me um, there would be familiar faces around college and I, I think I find that really comforting. Fab, thank you. Um, there's a very general question about singing experience um, and this sort of links to how we prepare for auditions but what sort of singing experience did people have before coming up um either either coming up to cambridge full stop or before the audition and then receiving advice on how best to prepare uh graham may i come to you after ben if that's all right ben gibson let's say um yeah so uh i sung at school um which was much lower commitment obviously than um singing at jesus is um, but I just, I, I mean, you just kind of adjust a lot. And also within our choir, there's such a huge variation of how much experience people had had before. Um, and as someone who I think was on the lower end of that spectrum when I arrived, you don't really notice. Um, and it doesn't feel like there's a huge gap. And because it becomes quite, um, because you learn so fast singing in a choir at Cambridge, everyone kind of very much is on the same same page going in um and very shortly after arriving so uh yeah thanks graham i think people apply to cambridge with very different backgrounds and i think that's what makes our choirs such a wonderful place so i think probably all the directors of music here in this webinar can can think of people who have applied to their choirs who have had a really rich musical upbringing and perhaps sung in their school choir or perhaps in one of the national choirs or maybe being part of a cathedral um, choir and that's great but I think we can also all name people who've come to our choirs who have sung nowhere more than just their shower and I, I mean that with total sincerity and I've had many people who've applied um, to me at Clare who've had plenty of experience and plenty who've been very honest and said I don't have any experience and what we're always looking for as director of music is potential. It's the most important thing that we can look for. And you have to remember that when you apply, if you're maybe 17, um, possibly sometimes a little earlier, we sometimes hear people sing to us, but you know, if you're starting your undergraduate degree, typically at the age of 18, with the greatest of respect, your voice is still in its very early stages of development at this stage. And over the course of your three or four or six years of your degree, it will change. And I've had people who've applied to me as a, as a very low mezzo and left as a kind of queen of the night soprano and everything else in every other possible direction you can imagine. And I think that um, I just want to, I'm not going to name them, but there are two people who, who have been members of Clare College Choir, who for me are the, are the greatest success stories by which I mean that they started with such little experience, but what they had was real determination and real interest in having a go and doing a good job. And they started off as very nervous, timid, um, I'm not even gonna say what gender or voice part they were, singers, and they, they really worked at it. And I did make them work at it because I, I wanted to see them come to fruition and they went through three years of their time and by the time that they graduated they were really 
some of the very best singers that we've ever had. And so I, I think what I'm trying to say here is, is the experience that you've had at school or not had at school, uh, or whether you've been in a choir or not, give it a go. You know, you really don't know what's going to come your way. And it's our job as directors to find that potential and to see if we can tease some musicality out of you. And it's really exciting when we can. Thank you. Um, unless anyone else has anything further on that, um, there is a general question about your favourite experience on tour, which may or may not involve an 11 hour wait in an airport. Um, I wonder, uh, Alistair, if you might speak to that first. Sure. Uh, so I've been on two tours with, with John's. The first was to um, Aix-en-Provence in France and the other to the Netherlands. Um, and actually the first one I, I'd probably say was like the most amazing because it was like we, we were performing at a at a big kind of concert hall in in Aix and uh, it was just like it was like if, if I've never sung somewhere like that before and it was just amazing to um, it was like 2000 people or something and big auditorium super swanky and I just thought wow this is this is what this is what it's all about <laughs> so I'd say that was a, that was a pretty and then like you know all, all the things around that as well you know, nice hotel, hanging out with your friends and going to nice restaurants, stuff like that. But I'd say that, that actually that that concert hall itself was just you know, I kind of kind of kind of had to pinch myself because I was a freshman. This was the end of first term. And I just thought, go, oh, this is fun. Um Kat. Yes. Interesting tour experiences. Interesting tour experiences. Have, have, have you any that are suitable for public consumption? Well, I haven't. I, I've, I haven't at all. Uh, no, I'm not going to answer that one for various reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the I was trying to think of my favourite tour experience. I, I simply cannot say it in this forum. Um, perhaps Harry? Or is it, um, sorry, is Ralph waving at me? I can't tell. <laughs> Harry, then. Oh, pressure, so, yeah. We haven't talked oh, because of COVID, but we're planning to go to um siren sister so a local tour this summer which i'm very excited about i've heard touring is very very fun the best part of choir and siren sister is beautiful mm. um we went to siren sister on my first year tell your coach driver not to take the side roads it's extremely okay. unpleasant um okay. ralph i think you're waving i can't tell well i just wanted to say that i've been on or organized about 50 choir tours and the, still my favorite one is one of the first ever which was with kings with david wilcox and going in into a church in toronto singing a concert and with a packed hall of people and as we came out seeing a woman who'd never heard anything like psalm 150 with the glorious um, desk and just bursting into tears at the end of it and uh, so, you know, realising the effect you have when you sing in a choir, that I've always remembered that as the great moment. Thank you. I wonder, Andrew, might you also come to this? The particular favourite tour moment? Tour moment? Uh, gosh, well, there are yeah, one or two unmentionable ones from when I was a student, I suppose. But um, no, we've done, all, we've done all sorts of things and uh, amaz amazing places in, in Japan, for instance, and... Uh, you know, going to the the tea ceremonies and this kind of you know it, just it, experiencing the culture in in lots of uh, parts of the world that we might not otherwise go to if we weren't doing tours. Um, and the kind of thing that Ali was saying about you know singing in some of the some of the top um, concert halls in the world. Uh, so that was the, the the Grand Opera House in Aix. Ali was mentioning, but but um, to to sing in the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam on a you know a, a live um, televised concert is yeah, that's really the the kind of pinnacle, I think. So yeah, lots, lots of fun things. Thank you. Um, two more people on this. Can you um, Ben Parry, please? Yeah, and that that concert that Andrew mentioned at the Concertgebouw, I think, is on YouTube, so you can watch it in all its glory. Um, yeah, sorry to rub salt into the wound, Graham, but but um, Iceland was <laughs> was great. Um, I mean, two two tiny things there. The Hallgrimskirk in Reykjavik is a is a beautiful building, and they wanted us to sing a King's Evensong, so we sang the Collegium Regal by Howells and Blessed Pair of Sirens by Hubert Parry um, as part of that Evensong with this extraordinary organ at the back of the of the of the church. 
um, and that was wonderful. And then the extreme was going out into the the glaciers and the volcanoes to a little place called oh Skalholt, which was a little seminary just in the I mean, literally in the middle of nowhere, where we sang with a with a local choir of about ten Icelanders, um, and they wanted to sing Bird and Talis and things like that. Um, but we were literally in the middle of nowhere. All you could see around were mountains and, and glaciers. So hopefully, Graham, you'll you'll get to get to go there sometime. It's not that far away either, Iceland. Thank you. And uh, lastly, on this, Julia. Yeah, I mean, there are so many moments to choose from. Really, I've already mentioned uh, France and, of course, the the airport waiting time. Um, but really, I think in every tour you will find something that is just something you didn't think was going to happen. I mean, we went to Malta and it was kind of a beach holiday disguised as a choir tour. I mean, it was amazing. It was wonderful. And where we sang was amazing and all the people you meet. Um, and then going from someplace like Malta and then on your next tour, going to Jackson, Mississippi, which I mean, never thought I would um and Canada and Mexico City I mean really everything is amazing and I think you will have times on tour where you're like wow this is this is a lot and this is a lot of time and you know it's it's exciting but it's also tiring but it's worth it it's a hundred percent worth it um and really I mean I think especially as a linguist meeting people who are completely different from me and come from completely different backgrounds or in, and are just so welcoming and staying in their homes for example we do that quite a lot um it's just it's just amazing and i would just say go for it if you've got the chance i think that there's probably no better advertisement for what we are here to do than those words so if with that we might wrap things up unless anyone has anything that they really urgently want to share they feel that hasn't been adequately touched on by the questions um i shall thank all of our panelists for being here on a saturday afternoon when it is gloriously sunny out of doors and there are things other, other to do than sitting on zoom